Good morning. It's uh, the appointed hour, and uh, uh, we'll come to order. I'm John Baker, and uh, Hapstein and I are co-chairs of this board task force. I, I want to thank all of you all for agreeing to serve um, and for being here today on what may be a very rainy exit. Uh, Hopefully not. Um, I think this is a hugely important issue that we've been asked to look at in, in complex with political issues, with financial issues, and with environmental issues. And uh, Hap and I have talked about how we go about this. And what, what we propose, and of course, we'll do whatever the will of the group is, um, but I think if you look at this issue um, of, of deepening the harbor, the, the first thing to do is to understand the costs and the benefits of doing the project. And the costs are monetary and huge, and they're environmental and important. Um, the benefits are jobs, uh, the growth of the city, and there will, you know, there clearly has to be an understanding of is, is it, is it worth it? Is the, is the project worth the cost? Um, if indeed we determine that it's worth it, then I think the ne next aspect is how do we pay for it? What, because there <clears throat> is very definitely a local bill to be paid. And as we all know, money isn't flowing out of the coffers like we all wish it would. So our thought is that we would, uh, today will be an organizational meeting. We'll do the Sunshine uh, Law briefing, which I know you all are looking forward to. <laughs> and then we'll hear from Brian Taylor, who's the CEO of Jacksport, and have him uh, kind of give us an overview of the project and where it is. Um, and we'll hear from the mayor, and I, I think it would be good if we all went around the room and introduced ourselves and kind of talked about why this is of interest to us. Um, and hopefully we'll be out of here quickly. In the future meetings, what I would think we would do would be to invite subject matter experts to come in and we pick one topic for each meeting and really dive into it and understand, uh, hopefully, uh, that topic well as we go through it um, and then move on to the next one and uh, logically uh, attack the issue. Um, I would love, and I know Hap feels the same way, to, for, for you all, if you know of people that you think ought to be presenting to us, please let us know. Um, We'll have some suggestions, and you'll see at the end of the meeting, we've got kind of a proposed schedule, and uh, obviously that's dependent on everybody in this room, but the thought is we meet once, roughly once a month, maybe skip one in the summer, and plow through this project. So uh, with that introduction, uh, I know the, the mayor wants to say a few words to us and explain how he talked us into doing that. <laughs> okay. That's okay with your time schedule? Yes, sir. Quentin, why don't you start off and tell us who you are and what, your, uh, what you do for a living and what your interest is, and we'll just go around the room. Okay, well, I, are we on? I turn sure. the mics over. Everything's operating. Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Quinn White. I'm on the faculty at Jacksonville University where I am a professor of biology and marine science and uh, executive director of the Marine Science Research Institute. I've been in Jacksonville since 1976 and been studying the river since then. So to say I have a vested interest in the St. John's River and its ecology and health is probably an understatement. But looking forward to this. Um, I was reflecting this weekend when the mayor came over a few years ago now and we sat in what was in the river house and he told me he was running for mayor little did i know he'd get me hooked up to this kind of stuff now so here we go 
Uh, and I'm Joe Debs. Uh, I'm with the firm of RSNH, an uh, architect and engineering planning firm here in uh, Jacksonville. Um, we've got offices all over the country, in fact, different parts of the world now. Um, I serve as chief marketing officer today, but I'm a professional engineer and practicing in the transportation infrastructure business for 35 years plus now. I'm a Jacksonville native myself. In fact, uh, about 25 years ago, I was uh, the project manager for many of the uh, infrastructure projects that are in place uh, for Jacksport, including several out there in the Blunt Island area that are still active. Um, uh, my interest has uh, been in many aspects of infrastructure here in the community and uh, served on many committee committees. And uh, um, I should also point out that in full disclosure, our company does work with Jacksport. Uh, so that at some points in this discussion, so I may need to recuse myself on some things, but uh, I want to uh, lend whatever expertise I can in the way of uh, my engineering background uh, to, this, uh, to this effort. Thanks, Joe. Good morning. I'm Ron Townsend. Um, I was born in Jacksonville. Uh, I worked in several cities, Connecticut, New York, uh, Maryland, Connecticut, etc. But I retired and moved back to Jacksonville. And I've uh, been involved in the business community for a number of years. I've been involved in the JAA, JAA board. I'm currently on the JEA board. I was also on the panel that was uh, appointed by the mayor to do study and determine to split the ports. Uh, I'm here because the mayor asked me to be here, but also because uh, Hep Stein and John Baker. Hi, I'm Mark Middlebrook with the St. John's River Alliance. Um, the uh, For those of you who aren't familiar with the St. John's River Alliance, it's a uh, it was formed about 10, 12 years ago uh, as a direct outgrowth of the St. John's River being designated as an American Heritage River. So we're the successful organization to, to that effort. Um, we, uh, rep we work in all 310 miles of the river. Uh, we have, uh, we're unique in that we've got 12 elected officials uh, from each county, one from each county along the river that serve on our board. So we, all of us, uh, have a vested interest in the health of the river. Good morning. My name is Paula Pahla Harris, and I am a local attorney. I uh, work at Harris Sweetie and uh, in San Marco. I had moved here from Atlanta in 1997. I grew up in Miami, and uh, this is home now. I love this city. I love our river. Um, I am a mother of two children, and I have a vested interest as well. I am uh, looking around the room, and I'm clearly the token lawyer, but don't ask me to explain any of the legal aids, please. Uh, I do family law. <laughs> so I'm um, happy to be here. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Moody Chisholm. I'm the CEO of St. Vincent's Healthcare, and of course, St. Vincent's resides on the river, and uh, so it's an important uh, ecological aspect to us. But uh, in, beyond that, I'm also the chairman of the Northeast Florida Business Alliance for Transportation. And uh, so I'm, I recognize the importance of our port to our region as well. I'm Hap Stein. I'm a lifelong resident of North Florida. I love this community. We want to see it grow and prosper. I'm currently the CEO of Regency Centers. And uh, last year we celebrated our 50th uh, year in business since we were founded. And our roots, even though we're a national company in the shopping center business, our roots want run very, very deep here, and we want to see uh, very responsible but, but good growth for our community to grow and prosper uh, for the next hundreds of years. I'm John Baker. Uh, I'm executive chairman of Patriot Transportation, which is a real estate and um, trucking company. Uh, I grew up here, uh, grew up skiing on the river. I feel like I've, I've lived in that river off and on my whole life. I love to fish, um, and I'm a businessman. And, and this this really interests me because, as I mentioned to you earlier, it is it is a complicated and complex issue that is really, really important to the future of our city. And you know, I think it's important that we dig into it and do it right. And I, I just, I'm looking forward to working with you guys, and I think it'll be fun. Bob Lufrano, retired uh, physician and, and healthcare executive. Um, Jacksonville has been our home for the last 25 years, and um, we're incredibly fond of the natural resources and the growth and the development in the city and the surrounding area. 
um, this is a unique opportunity um, that, that Northeast Florida, maybe South Georgia, has. And I think our ability to look at it um, openly and discuss it is a real nice opportunity. Um, and pleased to, to be here and be able to participate. My name is Pete Carpenter. I was formerly president of CSX uh, Transportation. Uh, I've been retired for several years now. Have lived in Jacksonville for 25 years. Love the town. And quite frankly, because of some probably weird <coughs> mechanism in my head, I love tough trade-offs. And this is a tough trade-off kind of uh, issue for, for uh, the city. But I want to see it grow. I want to see it prosper. But I live on the river. I've lived on the river for 25 years. And it's a major asset for this community. And we have to do the right by our river as well. So thank you very much. I'm Ray Holt, a city council member for District 11, which includes a lot of uh, the riverfront uh, along Hexer Drive um, and uh, most of the port facilities, uh, including um, Payne's Point area, and happy to be here. Janet Owen, I'm Vice President of Governmental Affairs at UNF, also a lawyer, but don't usually admit it publicly. <laughs> 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 Welcome to, anyway, um, but also born and raised here. I don't, I'm not sure I've ever been with this many natives before in one spot. It's neat. Grew up fishing and um, skiing as well on the river. Uh, from UNF, I come from a, a group of people who are probably on all sides of this issue, scientists, um, uh, environmentalists, and economists. I serve as uh, vice chair of the Chamber's Logistics Committee. So I'm very interested in, in, um, in the growth of the city and how to do that responsibly. Uh, as, a, as a lobbyist, I spend a lot of time in Tallahassee, so I know how to bother people like Representative Ray. Uh, and, um, and I also see a lot of our competition in Orlando, Miami, and Tampa. And I'm, uh, as a native, I'm also very uh, committed to Jacksonville being all that it can be and competing in what I think is a, a state of city state. So um, I'm honored that the mayor would ask me to be part of this, and I look forward to it. Thank you. My name is Lathan Bregman. I'm general manager of Beaver Street Fisheries, or Seabest. You go to the Sharks game through the Jaguar game, you see Seabest. And um, we are very much involved in the community, and um, I take a great privilege and pleasure to serve on this committee. And I'm here because of Hapstein and John Baker and the mayor. Uh, so I look forward to working with each of you and uh, helping move Jacksonville forward and doing the best thing for the city of Jacksonville and for the natives here. I'm um, Matt Kane. I'm the owner of Green Shade Software, which has nothing to do with the port. And um, I, uh, I also sit on the board at JU, but since Quint's here, I'll be playing the part of concerned and engaged citizen. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm very excited to be part of this and very, very excited to be, be involved. Good morning. I'm Adam Herbert. Uh, I'm a uh, retired school teacher. Uh, <laughs> I, I was a professor of public policy for a little over 40 years, uh, was a university president, had the Good fortune of coming to Jacksonville in 1989 to serve as president of the University of North Florida. Did that for 10 years. Did serve as chairman of the Jacksonville Chamber of Commerce, uh, as it was called then. Um, was chancellor of the state university system and most recently president of Indiana University. As I indicated, uh, my areas of interest primarily focus on public policy questions. Uh, and so uh, uh, I can't think of very many issues as important to this community is what happens with regard to the river. I might also note that uh, I'm on the police fire and pension board trying to find something to do to keep me intellectually stimulated. <laughs> and uh, we're having a meeting right now, so I'm gonna have to excuse myself shortly to go over for that because we have a couple of really critical issues, but this is extremely important. I wanted to be here uh, to express uh, my appreciation for, to, to both of you for agreeing to serve as our leaders in this effort and thank the mayor for the opportunity to serve. Well, since you've been on the police and fire and pension thing, uh, we'll, we'll spend a lot of extra time telling you about the sunshine law. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I have learned. I think you've li probably lived that the last 30 years. Mayor, you see what you've done, who you've put together. It's a pretty good group. Would, would you say a few words? <laughs> Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I first want to thank the task force co-chairs and each of one of our task force members for your commitment and service to our community. Uh, you are volunteers and you don't have to be here. We're not paying you. I'm sure that there are many other things you could be doing right now, uh, but you're here. And you're here because you care about Jacksonville. You care about our future and you care about our port and its vital role in our region. We've asked you to join this task force because as individuals, you are highly respected leaders who offer a wide range of backgrounds and perspectives. And you just heard a wide range of backgrounds and perspectives, each one of you coming from different points of view. Uh, and that's important for this process. And together you bring invaluable experience and expertise you represent nothing less than the collective wisdom of our community. I believe all of Jacksonville will have full confidence in what you do. As you hold your first meeting today, you already start with some great new momentum behind you with the announcement that the Corps of Engineers Chief Report support the project to deepening the Port Harbor. This is a major step forward. Our congressional delegation is also optimistic about the Water Resource Development Bill, currently pending in Washington. This would provide congressional authorization that's essential for the project to advance and secure federal funding. We need to get this legislation passed and signed into law by the president. Even then, and this goes to John Baker's comments earlier, there will still be work to do, not only to ensure the success of the Harbor Project, but also to support the broader priorities of the port uh, strategies to allow us to be competitive in a marketplace to make sure that the role of the port focuses on uh, job creation and economic development. That it is so important that we take a broad look at this process. In forming this task force, I've asked you to take on three fold mission. First, I ask you to study the strategic priorities of Jacksport Board uh, initiatives that they've established and discuss how to build community support for those priorities. So the good news is Jacksport, uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Brian Taylor and the board has already established priorities. Second, I ask you to engage in a thoughtful and deliberate community conversation about the deepening of the harbor. When I say thoughtful and deliberate discussion, I mean it. In a community as large as ours, there are many points of view, and I'm sure Lisa Reinemann would be an example of testament to that. Good to see you, Lisa. Thank you for being here. All of them deserve to be heard. And I know with this distinguished task force, you'd allow all points of view to be heard. And finally, I ask you to explore how we make the financial investment necessary to achieve the harbor deepening. The federal government will contribute, the state will contribute, but we must come together as a community and a region to do our part. And I can say, as the quarterback of the team, we have good team players on the field. Uh, and I think it's important as you look at the chief's report and everything that's going on in Washington uh, with Brian Taylor and his board, uh, Jack's chamber, Daniel Davis and his team, uh, the congressional delegation with Senator Rubio and Nelson and Congresswoman Brown and Crenshaw, uh, and all working together. We all work together as a team, and that's important. And Governor Scott, who laid the foundation and made it a priority in, of his administration to make sure that ports all around Florida are a priority, including Jacksonville. And that's important. So the Governor Scott and the state has made it a priority. So in addition to that, in my role as chairman for the U.S. Conference of Mayors of Exports and Ports, uh, if you look at what's happening in Congress when it comes to putting people back to work, cities play a major role along with the ports to improve the quality of life and making sure that they, they remain an economic engine. And so 
working with the members of Congress, uh, working with the delegation, with all the mayors and governors really making the case about how important this is. So your job is very important and you have a strong foundation to work from. Our progress to date has been possible only because everyone working together. As I said, the leadership of Jacksport City Council, our business community, all of us working together. And our whole community has a stake in the success of our port. And I want our whole community to be a partner in our continuing effort to support the port and do what's right for Jacksonville. And that's why we formed this task force. And that's why you're here. And again, I want to thank each, each of you for your commitment and time. It's a lot of work, but it's important. I believe that, and Brian will speak to this, this will change a generation to allow Jacksonville to compete in a global economy. No longer can we just think about uh, Jacksonville competing against Charlotte or, or Savannah or Miami or Tampa. It's not about that. It's bigger than that. It's about positioning our city to be on a global stage. And that's why I'm so happy we're a part of the Global City Initiative, uh, putting together a strategy for exports and ports for Jacksonville. We're one of eight cities, a five-year commitment. J.P. Morgan Chase put up $20 million for that initiative. And we're a part of that. So positioning us to compete in a global economy, making sure that, that we are a destination, uh, growing jobs. It's all about jobs. It's all about the quality of life. And I think you have an opportunity to play a major role to change the course of history in our city. And so I thank you so much because it's gonna require time and effort and energy and commitment, and you've committed to that. And I'm so proud of each and every one of you that you've agreed to take on this responsibility. You're well respected in the community. I have great confidence that it's all gonna work out. And in the end, I think, and I'm very optimistic, everybody knows I'm an optimistic person, uh, uh, it's all gonna work out. I'm humbled that you agreed to serve I really look forward to working with you. And I believe when good people work together, good things happen. So thank you for this opportunity, uh, Mr. Chairman, Co-Chair, uh, Baker and Stein. Thank you for your leadership. Thank each and every one of you who, as Ron Townsend says, he's been all around the country, uh, but now he's back home. And he has a chance to change the course of history for the next generation. Um, I want to say to Brian Taylor, uh, who's here, and he's going to give remarks, I want to thank you, my friend, for your leadership and your board, doing a great job. I appreciate the teamwork. Uh, as the quarterback of the team, I have one of the best receivers in America, and we're going to sign him up for the Jaguars this year. <laughs> Brian Taylor, who understands the importance of the port, comes with great expertise. Uh, I want to thank him, and I want to thank Again, Councilman uh, Ray Holt, thank you for agreeing to serve. It's important for our city. We're all in this together. Uh, and uh, I can't say thank you enough because uh, it's so important. And I will, in closing, while, we're, while, while the chief report is done and we still have a lot of work to do, we'll still be working with our congressional delegations. We'll still make sure that we push uh, and work together with mayors around the country and governors and business leaders. And there are some business leaders in this city who really went to work for us uh, and pushing very hard. Uh, one of the things uh, Chairman Schuster said to me, uh, who chairs the Transportation Committee, he spoke at the U.S. Conference of Mayors in June and this past January, and he said to the mayors, make sure the business community is involved, make sure they educate our delegation, the members of Congress, on how important this is because it's all about jobs and improving the quality of life, but taking a balanced approach in how we do this. So we heard them loud and clear. And so thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
Before we lose him, do, you, do any of you all have any questions you want to ask the mayor? Okay. Chris, um, we have on the agenda Alexis Lambert to do the sunshine. Is she here? Hi there. I'm Alexis Lambert. I work here in the mayor's office in the Office of Public Affairs. I oversee public records compliance for the city. And I'm just here to give you all just kind of a brief uh, to, you know, overview of the Sunshine Law and how it applies to you in your service on this particular board. Uh, chapter 286 of the Florida Statutes is what's known colloquially as the Sunshine Law. And what that means is that uh, discussions of pending business before public boards and commissions needs to be conducted at properly noticed public meetings where minutes are taken. Okay. That's the short version of the story. Uh, many of you appear to know each other in real life, and your service on this board uh, does not mean that you need to ignore each other when you see each other at the supermarket. It does not mean that you need to like cover your eyes and run away from each other at Jaguars games or uh, when you're dropping off your children at school. Uh, it just means that the discussions of the, of the business that you conduct uh, as it pertains to this particular board need to happen in rooms like this during notice meetings while Miss Carroll is taking minutes. I would suspect that those of you who know each other in your real lives have other things to discuss than the business that takes place within this room. Uh, under Florida law, the Attorney General years ago had opined that even husbands and wives can serve on the same public board and commission. I can't imagine why a husband and wife would actually want to serve on a public board or commission, but under Florida law, they can do so as long as they don't discuss the, bus the pending business before that board. And that includes foreseeably pending business before that board. Uh, other things you guys should consider when you're planning <clears throat> your upcoming meetings and, uh, and things to think about. You don't want to have uh, meetings of this board at restaurants or at places where members of the public would have to spend money or possibly feel like they would have to expend money in order to gain entrance or to feel like they could stay there. Uh, meetings in places like this or in public libraries or other places where anyone can walk in uh, and just feel like anybody else are the kinds of places where you want to have these meetings. Uh, also, your email, uh, one way to just protect your own sanity, all the email that you receive in reference to this board, you should really keep it in a separate folder uh, from the rest of your professional and personal life so that in the event you receive a public records request from someone who is interested in reading the incredibly mundane scheduling emails that have absolutely no discussion of pending business before this board because none of you would ever do that because it would violate the law, uh, you could immediately produce that email and forward it to anyone who asks for it. Uh, if you don't handle your own email, ask whichever uh, employee or person who handles your email to do that for you. It's very easy to do in Outlook or Gmail or any other email platform that uh, modern human beings utilize in this day and age. Um, just, <clears throat> uh, it's something that will uh, make public records requests remarkably simple and easy to produce. If you, uh, the email address that you provide uh, to Ms. Carroll for the purpose of receiving correspondence, it doesn't, you know, the email address would be subject to disclosure under a public records request. Not all of your correspondence on that email address is subject to public inspection. Just the email in connection with your service on this board is subject to inspection under the public records law. So your entire personal life is not subject to you know, uh, inspection and copying by the public. Just you know, the correspondence that you make and receive in connection to this board. Um, so you have not... You know, you've not exposed your entire life to the fishbowl, just the work that you do on this board. But do you have any, uh, it appears that several of you have served on public boards and commissions in other parts of your life, so this doesn't appear to be completely unfamiliar. Yes, Mr. Townsend. Uh, 
Uh, as it relates to emails, I normally delete those emails. I don't save those emails. You're telling us we should not delete these emails? Never. No, no, no. Save them. Uh, it's, All emails really? <laughs> even just the scheduling ones, you want to save them and keep them. Yeah, they're public records and you don't want to delete them. Okay. <coughs> Alexis, yes, sir. if Hap and I are trying to put together an agenda for the next meeting, are we allowed to talk about that type of stuff or is that over the telephone or is that got to be in the public? Scheduling stuff, yes, but you want to be very careful, I mean, you want to be real careful about what you mean by agenda. Um, Tell me, help me, I'm not usually very careful. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you want to keep it very ministerial, uh, and, uh, you know. Who to invite to a meeting? Is that, well, who to I, invite to speak at a meeting? Is that, you, or if another member wanted that to say, I think we ought to. Handle that in a public meeting. Keep, you know, you want to keep the discussions about what you're doing and what you're discussing in forums like this so that any member of the public, whether they're from Jacksonville or not, whether they're media or public, could theoretically walk in and watch it happen. You want to keep your email and your, your written and digital correspondence as, as ministerial and calendar oriented as possible. You don't want the written correspondence related to this board to be at all interesting. Yes, sir. With regard to this kind of uh, administrative uh, handling of things, it seems to me that I had a briefing uh, when I was uh, chairing uh, a, a commission for the government whereby he had the equivalent of Miss Carroll and an attorney mm -hmm. that were available to me to codify to record uh, setting up next meetings, etc. That was made available to the public. I think it was put on the website. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to satisfy uh, not putting us in handcuffs, as you, as you will, for setting up agendas, inviting yes. interesting people that might bring a lot to the subject where the, the logistics of getting everybody on that commission together mm -hmm. and in a public forum to do that was, was beyond my ability. And right. so uh, when I raised the issue, they came up with that solution. And I wonder if that's sort of a solution. That, yes, staff is good for things like that. Uh, they can handle things. You, just, you don't want to use staff as a conduit to avoid the Sunshine Law. You don't want to have staff doing polls and telling people what other people are saying. But <clears throat> your discussions between each other need to be things like, I'm available on Monday but not Tuesday. Uh, I can do 2 o'clock but not 3 o'clock for things like scheduling. But you can talk to people like Miss Carroll for things like, you know, it would be really great if we could hear with from this, you know, this engineer from UNF, or we've got this subject matter expert at JU who knows a lot about some science thing that I have no concept of because I'm from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So, and the liberal artsy side, not the sciencey side. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, that's what staff is for. Just make sure that you don't, you know, but, but staff, is, staff is for, you know, those kinds of discussions, but not for, you know, the Sunshine Law is, you know, in, in the fancy legalese terms, the staff is, you know, the Sunshine Law is to be construed in a way so as to frustrate all evasive devices, which means talk to staff, but don't try to utilize the staff to, you know, mine them for information about what other people are saying when, when you're not around. But otherwise, email is for, for calendar stuff and for scheduling stuff. And the discussions about the business of what you're doing is to take place in rooms like this so that any old person off the street can come in and watch it and unobtrusively record it and see exactly what's going on. And we're glad you guys are here because this stuff is cool and interesting, especially for people like me who don't know the first thing about signs. Other questions? Sounds I'm on like the second floor of anything. City Hall. If you have questions, <laughs> feel free to call or visit. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure 
we'll be calling you <laughs> when we think of a way to avoid it legally. Along the lines of what Pete said, Chris Hand, who is uh, many of you may know, is uh, is kind of been assigned to us. Uh, I see he stepped out with the, uh, the mayor, but um, I think we can rely on him uh, to help us. Um, some of the staff help we're going to get uh, for administrative support, agendas, materials, and, and speakers is from uh, Becky Dix of Jacksport. Becky, are you here today? She's not here, John. But, uh, okay. We'll make sure that she gets introduced to all of the uh, members of the staff. Um, I, I assume Miss Carol is Carol Wells. Thank you very much for, for doing this. And uh, yes. uh, James Croft, thank you for your support too, James. Uh, we appreciate it. And Sandra Stockwell of the General Counsel's Office. I saw Sandra. She is. She told us. She told me that she would look after us legally, uh, but not criminally. <laughs> I didn't understand what she meant until Alexis. <laughs> Brian Taylor is next on our agenda to kind of give us an update on Jack's board. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's a. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to get this opportunity to work with you on this task force. This is, uh, you've heard it several times, a complex issue, but one that is incredibly important to this, uh, to this community. We're here today because of what you see in that picture. Uh, that is a ship uh, from Mitsui uh, OSK line that arrived here in Jacksonville on the 24th of February. <clears throat> Uh, it is the largest ship that we have handled here uh, in Jacksonville. Uh, this ship is 6,700 TEUs, 20-foot equivalent units. And that's a unit of measure that you use in the maritime industry to evaluate size and quantity of, of all things maritime. So how many TEUs do you move through a terminal? How big, uh, how many TEUs is on a ship? How many TEUs does a carrier handle annually? How many TEUs do we move globally? Uh, in the containerized transportation market. Everything will revolve around TEU, so an important acronym for you to recognize. This ship doesn't come through the Panama Canal. The Panama <coughs> Canal is 4,500 TEUs maximum size. This ship came here through the Suez Canal. But in order to come into our harbor, it came in with a thousand less boxes on it than this ship is capable of handling. As the Panama Canal expansion opens uh, in about two years or less, the frequency of these ships is going to become much greater. And these size ships will be calling all of the ports on the East Coast. But in order to remain competitive, we are going to have to have a shipping channel that allows these ships to come in fully loaded and allow us to be competitive with other ports uh, primarily in the South Atlantic. And you can think of the two ports to the north as our primary competitors. So look, I, I'm excited that the mayor has established this task force to help us address you know, this particular issue. This is a great opportunity for me you know, to have access to you, uh, civic leaders, strategic thinkers. You know, I heard you, many of you say how long you've been in the city. You know about the past you know about the present, and you have the ability to think about the vision of where this city and this region needs to go. I look at you as a group that you know, has the ability to ask tough questions, but then also figure out how to find the best path to move forward to address the tough issues. And there are some tough issues here. So, you know, the mayor was kind enough to say some nice things about me. Um, I, I've been in this business for 30 years, uh, all of it on the carrier side. I know how to run terminals. I know how to run ships. I know about the maritime industry. I don't know as much about Jacksonville as you do. 
And I think the combination of what is here gives us an ability to make the right decisions for the future. And I thank the mayor for his foresight and his leadership to put this group together and for getting us involved in what he mentioned before, the Brookings Institute Global Cities Initiative. It's about building exports. It's about creating jobs. You want to move exports, you have to have a vibrant port capable of handling. These ships, when they leave, in the last two months, we've left hundreds of containers sitting on the dock because we can't put them on the ship. Every export box that we take out of here is primarily agricultural product. It weighs a lot. It's 25 metric tons on average per export container. And you can only put so many of them on this ship of this size before it touches the box. So as we seek to grow exports, we need to make sure that we've got a way to move the exports. So as you start down this path, I'm going to ask, or I'm going to provide a, a couple of initial thoughts. This project is about positioning this city and this region for the future. It's about building upon the transportation and logistics hub we've already created here in Northeast Florida. It's about making sure we continue to create a vibrant city and a region that has the jobs to attract and retain the human capital, the intellectual talent that we need to fulfill that vision. And building for the future is going to require, I believe, some courageous leadership. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about this region. Think about the Dames Point Bridge. Think about Butler Boulevard. Think about the Fuller Warren Bridge. I wasn't here when any of those were done. You were. There was a lot of opposition to those projects, a lot. A lot of reasons why they were not the right things for us to do. I say today, as a new person here, I couldn't live without those things. And I don't think you could either. And I believe this project is one of those things we can't live without 20 years from now. Second thing I'm going to say is this project is about balance. I say it all the time. I heard the mayor mention it. How do we thoughtfully and responsibly balance the need to create jobs and economic opportunity for the citizens of this region, yet still protect and preserve our environment? I've only been here for nine months, but I have come to appreciate the great things that we have here, including this river. We need to protect all of those natural resources. But I believe we as a community are smart enough to figure out how to strike that balance. And communities around this nation do it every day. And if they do it and we don't, we'll get left behind. And I don't think this region wants to get left behind. So I am going to change gears for a minute and talk to you specifically about a timeline. You know, I want to establish a good baseline as we start these discussions, so I'm going to take you through our current thinking on the project's potential timeline, and then I'm going to take you through the next slide, which is kind of the, what we estimate to be the cash outflows per year for the duration of this project. So you heard the mayor uh, mention, you probably read it yesterday, we did receive our chief's report signed by the Corps of Engineers on April 16th. That's a big step for us. It's a big hurdle for us to overcome, but it is one of many hurdles we still have left in front of us. The authorization that we need for that project to move forward will be pending in the Water Resource Development Act bill that is sitting in conference in DC. And we believe, from what we're hearing, that it will come out of conference in May and our project will be included as an authorized project in that bill, along with our project to complete Mile Point, the navigational challenge that we already have in the St. John's River. So what happens next? Pre-construction engineering and design, you'll hear us reference frequently what's called the PED phase. The study, the feasibility study by the Corps has been done. Now you actually have to do the design work. How are you going to do this project uh, from an engineering perspective. That will begin in June 
of this year. And the estimated completion that we have from the Corps of Engineers is September of 2015. Project cost, the budget is $7.2 million. The federal government has already allocated $5.4 million for this phase, uh, and we will contribute the other 1.8 million from our Jacksport operating budget. So once you complete the PED phase, that now says how this project is going to be done from an engineering perspective. You would then move to the construction phase. And you've seen this number in the material that we've already sent you. 684 million is the total project cost. That actually includes the 7.2 that you see above, but the total project cost is $684.2 million. The breakdown between federal funds, and this is typical federal funds for a project like this, is 65% comes from the feds. The balance comes from the non-federal sponsor, which would be the state and local contribution. The number for non-federal funds is large, and it's larger because we are paying for the incremental two feet from 45 to 47 feet, and the cost for that is $96 million. We bear that cost 100%. That is included in the non-federal funds. Assuming that the PED completes in September 2015, we would begin the actual work on this project uh, in 2016 with an estimated completion date of 2020. See, but you would, Brian, once you have complete drawings, then you'd have final Yes, sir. 684, 684.2 is the current estimate. Yes, sir. When this project was first contemplated, the estimated cost was about $800 million, as the Corps had continued to do the work uh, on the feasibility study. We actually got the project down, the cost down to 684. That also includes $82 million worth of birth, birth replacements that have to be done at Blunt Island. Those births have to be replaced no matter what, folks. Even if we don't deepen this harbor to 47 feet, that $82 million has to be spent. Those berths are old, they have reached the end of their useful life, and they will have to be replaced. Yes, Moody? Does that amount include the mile point? Or it not? does not. Mile point is separate from this. Uh, the governor has actually already put up $36 million for mile point. It's set in an account right now as soon as the project is authorized, meaning the mile point project is authorized in the water resource bill will begin the construction on mile point using the funds from that separate account. Right. You, you said that that 96 million to go from 45 to 47, uh, we must pay for that. But did you mean that we is just non-federal? Non-federal. It, it could be state. Yes, correct. With it's it's state. included in that non-federal share. So that is local and state contribution for the non-federal share. What's the timeline on the mile point construction? It, if we would begin uh, this project in June, our estimated completion is the end of 2015 or possibly early uh, 2016. And we want to have that project complete at the time that the Panama Canal expansion would open because at least we'd be able to take lightly loaded larger ships in on a more frequent basis. Might explain the reason for the mile point construction. Sure. Um, this is a navigational hazard that we have on the St. John's River. It is where the uh, intercoastal waterway intersects with the St. John's River and at uh, a, an outgoing tide or an ebb tide, uh, as the water flows out of the river, there is a tremendous current, cross current, that takes place at this intersection. And it actually uh, has the effect of pushing these larger ships towards the shore. Uh, and uh, it becomes a navigational challenge for them uh, to come through uh, at that point in time. And in fact, the uh, harbor pilots that escort the ships in have restricted those large ships to only eight hours transit of the channel through mile point per day. And that's two hours available for those ships to come through and exit on each high tide that we have. From a, the point of view of this commission, When's the drop dead date when we need to give a decision and not slow up the project? Um, look, the governor has already put some money uh, to uh, deepen the harbor in Miami. Uh, I actually support that. I think that's the right decision for the state. We, we as a state want to have a port 
that is at 50 feet when the Panama Canal opens, or the expanded Panama Canal opens. I think that's good for the state. We here don't really compete with Miami. The, the market that they serve is very different from ours. So I, I would say I'm not overly concerned about competitive activity from Miami. The ports that are of concern to us from a competitive perspective, and I think from a state perspective, is Savannah, Georgia, and Charleston, South Carolina. The majority of freight that comes into this state through a non-Florida port comes in through those two ports. And so as we look at the drop dead date, I would say we want our drop dead date to be concurrent or consistent with our competitive ports to the north. So Savannah will have an authorization in this Water Resource Development Act bill. They will spend approximately the same amount of money that we are going to spend on our project on theirs. And I think the drop dead date for us is we want to be starting our work and finishing our work at the same time that Savannah is starting and finishing theirs. So that to me is the drop dead date. So what, what date is that? I don't know that yet because their project hasn't been authorized and they haven't released their timeline. I mean, is it it's probably going to be pretty consistent with what I put September by summer of next year. I think that I think 2020 is a very realistic number for us to be. No, I'm talking about don't we need to? You will have completed the engineering and design, which is already in yes, sir. finance. Yes, sir. But by once we get the estimated cost of completion, we need to come up with a recommendation. The city needs to decide what that's going to do. Yes, I think by next summer we need to know what we're going to do. According to the schedule, about final recommendation of June 2015. So yes. Yes, sir. Yes, if we're talking about the recommendations from this committee, we really need to make a decision on what we want to do and the recommendations on how we might want to fund the non-federal share that we're going to be responsible for by the uh, by next summer. By next summer. What's Charleston date? Charleston is still working on their chief's report. They will not have a chief's report completed at the time that this water legislation is passed. Yes, sir. You had said that uh, Savannah was basically had the same outlay. Are they in the same situation where the chief's report takes them to a certain depth and they have to pay for another two feet on their own, or are they at a different depth is it, is it, and it just ended up being equal? They are currently at 42 feet, and they made a determination to go to 47 feet. Their project, the cost-benefit ratio of their project, allowed them to get federal funding all the way to 47 feet. Right. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit Savannah, Savannah Port about two years ago by another organization. And the impression I had in that they were years ahead of us. Am I? Mis did I misunderstand that? Uh, I don't think they're years ahead of us. They thought they were two years ago. I, I don't think they're years ahead of us. I think, you know, look, Savannah started this process 20 years ago. Right. 20 years ago. They set out with a plan. And I would say this to you. 20 years ago, Charleston was, oh, sorry, Savannah was smaller than the Port of Charleston 20 years ago. And they set out a plan to do certain things in logistics and transportation and global container trade, and they have religiously executed that plan over 20 years. And today, the Port of Savannah is two and a half times the size of the Port of Charleston. And how does it compare to the size wise? They're about three times the size of this port. Three times larger? Yes. So what I would say to you about this is the following. They put a plan in place 20 years ago, but they did it on a competitive playing field from the perspective of channel depth. They would not have achieved what they achieved if they were seven feet shallower than their competitive channel. And that's what I think we need to think about. We have set a plan in motion. We need to rel relentlessly execute that plan but we have to be on an even playing field. You said 371 is the non-federal funds. How much is the state indicated they're willing to pay? Uh, you know, the state has not uh, come up with a specific number. Uh, the slide that I will show you on the next page has been shared with the state. I was in Tallahassee last week. 
I think you have heard from the governor publicly and uh, some of you have heard from Secretary Prasad that they are going to be there to support this project. And I would expect to see uh, a good amount of support from them in that non-federal share. But I'm not going to speak for them specifically what that number is, but you know, in typical projects like this, the state is usually in for 50% of the non-federal share. Can a case be, although there's got to be a meaningful local commitment, can a case be made given the larger re potential regional impact that the state could possibly pay more than 50%? I think that's always possible to <coughs> happen. Could you, uh, uh, you haven't shared this slide, given us this. Could you, could you yeah, I've actually got hard copies that I'm going to give and, out to you. And also break out the, uh, the 80 million or 90 million dollars that has to be spent in any event when the report is deep All right, I'll make sure we get that for you. So as we look at that potential timeline that I just shared with you before, you'll see down in the bottom right-hand corner, that's the $684.2 million for the total project cost. You see the breakdown, again, 312.8 for the federal share, the non-federal share at 371.4. We sat down with the core. We looked at what would be the most likely outflows of cash over the period uh, in question from 2015 to 2020 for the completion of the project. And those are the numbers that you see on the right-hand side. So this is really to give you some perspective about the total project cost being broken up by a federal share, non-federal share, and what is the expenditure per year over the course of the next five years. So when we talk about 684 and what our share is of 371, it doesn't all happen at once. It happens over a period of five years. Questions on this? Brian, I guess, Naively, why are there differences in the relative amounts of federal, non-federal money if there's a percentage breakdown of cost? The majority of it is related to the extra two feet, number one, uh, and there is some portion of the mitigation cost that we are going to bear 100 <coughs> percent. And that's why you see the difference in some of the numbers. All right, I'm, this is the last slide I'm going to show you, but I'm going to finish up with two last thoughts uh, that I, I would like to leave with you. Um, look, I'm from the private sector, so I understand return on investment just like all of you do. And this project is about return on investment. We are talking about a significant amount of money broken out over five years, but I understand it's a lot of money for us to spend, and so we need to make sure that we're spending it wisely. This project is one of only five projects in the nation, dredging projects in the nation, deemed as nationally significant. This port that we have here in Jacksonville is one of 16, only 16 in the nation, ports that are designated as strategically significant to the Department of Defense. And we're the only one in Florida deemed a strategic port to the Department of Defense. So the federal government is already seeing a return on the money that they're going to put into this project. Our team has done multiple iterations of economic impact assessments on this project. We believe it produces a solid return on investment, and that return on investment was calculated using the state's formula. So the State Department of Transportation has a formula, that they use to evaluate projects, uh, infrastructure projects, and we used that formula to determine a return on investment based on project cost. And what that told us is every dollar that we would invest in this project would return $14.80 back to the state in economic activity. The analysis that was done together with our impact assessment partner shows that we will have a logistical and the economic attributes to compete with other ports in the South Atlantic and to secure some of the cargo today, and there is about 1.3 million TEUs that come into this state from a non-Florida port. So by doing what this project will do for us, 
it allows us to take advantage of the geographic and logistical attributes and the economics that we'll be able to provide to capture some of that 1.3 million TEUs that comes through non-Florida ports to destinations in Florida. The last thing I'm gonna leave you with, this project is about opportunity, jobs, and substantial economic growth for this region. Thousands of jobs, and we can debate how many thousands of jobs, we'll gladly do that, but thousands of jobs will be created for this region over the next two decades. These are private sector jobs, and I wanna be clear about that. Everybody may be thinking that because Jack, we're investing all this money in the harbor, that Jacksonville, Jacksport, is gonna grow dramatically. These are not Jacksport jobs, folks. These are private sector jobs. Private sector jobs that pay good wages, and those wages then get spent in this economy with a tremendous multiplier impact. So why is this project important to people who have nothing to do with logistics and transportation? Because those dollars that are spent back in this economy get spent on goods and services provided by citizens just like you. Businesses that you own and you run. That's why this project is so important. Building for the future, creating jobs and opportunity, and getting that money spent in this economy to create more jobs in private sector businesses that really drive economic growth in this nation. So look, I, you can tell I'm passionate about this. I'm excited about it. This is why I'm here. I mean, the easiest thing for me to do coming into this job would have been put my feet up on the desk and just do what we're doing. But I don't believe that's the right path for the future. The single biggest growth market in the world of global transportation is global containerized trade, specifically with Asia. We have grown that number tremendously over the last five years, and when we get together at the next meeting, I'll show you that. And if we don't do what is being suggested here, we lose what we already have, and we forego the single biggest opportunity that we have to stimulate tremendous economic growth here over the next two decades. So I look forward to working with you. Uh, I'm here as a resource for you. Whatever we can do to provide you with information and help you understand this, because it is complicated, uh, I look forward to, uh, to doing that and to working closely with you, and thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll have an opportunity to, in one of the sessions, to ask Brian how he thinks Jacksonville can compete with any the more specifics and the, and the strategic review of the Port Authority's priorities, et cetera. You tee up the, the next thing. To, uh, in, you, at your place, there is a, a proposed meeting schedule and topics. And as you can see, at our next meeting, May 12th, um, is, has Brian Taylor um, speaking at it. Um, and this is a lot to take in, and I think, and have help me on this, but I think there are several issues here. Number one, what's the best time of day for you all to meet? Is, I, I would throw out 3 to 5 or 3.30 to 5.30 in the afternoon. Is, is that suitable? or That's better for me. It works for me. That's fine. Just as long as we get it scheduled. Difference. I think we just got to get it scheduled. Morning. Does it pay any difference first in the morning or after the meeting? <laughs> I think it's about the same. Okay. <laughs> three, there's three acts. Yeah. <laughs> three acts, zero. Right. It's still the same. Um, we've, we've set some dates through August. And what I would ask, Brian, is if you could get uh, Becky to send out a... Uh, uh, a one of those scheduler things to each one of our uh, members finding out, A, if these dates that are on here work for them. Um, hopefully <coughs> these, these ones through August we, we can stick with. And then we would also want to have something for the, the months after that so we can try to get that on the, uh, on the schedule. Yes, sir. If I'm not mistaken, I think Becky may have already sent out a, uh, an 
an invite, calendar invite, to just about everybody on the committee. She received these boxes back for most of you. The committee uh, are acceptable. You accepted them. But we'll double check that uh, on Monday. We'll make sure that we've got everybody covered. And if we don't, uh, we'll make sure the calendar invites get out. If there are conflicts, we'll get back to our co chairs and uh, let them know we've got some conflicts. Is that fair? Perfect. Perfect. Um, Look through these, um, and, and, and Alexis, tell me if this works. Um, if, if we have speakers that we want to recommend to speak before this group, can, is it okay if we just ask everybody to send that in to Chris Hand and, and let him collect the, the speakers and, and help us schedule it? Is that Okay. Is she going? Okay. Good. Thank if we you. have suggestions, go do it now. Absolutely. Thank this you. is. Introduce yourself. Sure, Chris right. Hand. I'm the mayor's <laughs> chief of staff. Good to see all of you again. Alexis had to step out for a second, but let me just encourage you uh, that if you have speaker suggestions, as Mr. Chair, as Chairman uh, Baker indicated, feel free to email those to me or to Brian going forward. Any discussion about those is really best held in a public meeting, but certainly suggestions can be sent to staff, so don't hesitate to do that if you do have thoughts on who ought to be speaking to the task force, and we can help to facilitate that public discussion about them. First of all, before we get any specifics as far as suggestions, do these topics make sense? Um, I think these are the key topics. I mean, we thought were... <coughs> Uh, as we went around the room this morning, made a reference to the environmental impact and the river. I would, and I've started to just flip through the river keepers of the book here in terms of the introduction. I would strongly suggest that environmental impact gets pushed up. I think the fourth or fifth meeting is too late for that. And I'd just like to know, you know, I, my sense is that that should be an early meeting. That has to the speakers or speakers are, I'm not certain, obviously, the river keeper post may have some uh, conversation. But I would just suggest getting that up early in the Agenda. And that's, that would be fine. Um, yeah. I think some of the issue is like in that regard, you know, in addition to you know, Lisa's thoughts and just you know, for the record, um, Riverkeeper, which I am a member of, has, has forwarded a information package to the, uh, to the full committee. And some of it's going to, you know, we're going to rely on Quentin and Mark for also suggestions of, you know, other speakers relate, specifically related to, to the environmental impact. And we're, and we won't be just limited to just having one meeting related to that. I think okay. the agenda shows. I, and I'm, I, we can shuffle it any way you want, Ron. My, my very <coughs> sometimes orderly mind was that the first thing we've got to wrestle with is assuming there's no environmental issue. Is there is there sufficient payback to take that next step? And then I thought, all right, once we make that step, then then let's really dive into the environmental and weigh that versus. Right. I just that's just an orderly process, yes. and, uh, and, I, and I'm not challenging that. I'm just saying that it's like our fifth meeting, and so it's right. That's I I sure don't want by making it the fifth meeting to make it look like that it's not important. And, I mean, okay. appearance is reality sometimes. But you, but if you, yeah, but if you can't justify how uh, Jacksonville courts can compete with Savannah and the return on investment and things like that, and or, because one, one of the key speakers, if we don't have the support from the governor and the state and that amount of capital, I, don't, I think that it's going to be a bridge too far for this community to afford you need to hear from, from them and get that on the agenda too. Okay, I'm fine. Okay. Quentin? Along that lines, I, I want to applaud the concept of perspective of port customers. You've got that coming up in mm -hmm. August, because I think that's important. Uh, the other two components that I would thought of throw out there, I would like very much to hear from Savannah. Uh, Mr. Townsend talked about the fact that, that they're now, and Brian Taylor talked about the fact that three times us, and over the last 20 mm -hmm. years, apparently they've grown dramatically. I'd like to know what they've done and what we haven't done. Um, maybe looking backwards a little bit, has Jacksonville been as competitive as we should have been over the last 20 years? I realize 
maybe we can learn from mistakes we've made in the past if we look forward a little bit. Um, I've been struck by the fact that the Panama Canal was completed in 1914. It wasn't until 2010 that Jacksonville became fully Panamax compliant. <laughs> and so I question why we're rushing to deepen the Panama, you know, deepen Jacksport when it took 100 years for us to catch up to the original Panama Canal. Um, so it looks like there's an awful lot of money being spent. So I'd like very much to hear from representatives from Savannah as well as our own port customers because I've heard from a lot of people that bring in materials to Savannah because it's so much cheaper than bringing into Jacksonville. I want to know why. Uh, the other person I'd like to recommend is my colleague from the University of North Florida who's been doing a river project, porch project now for several years, David Jaffe. And I think it'd be important to put him on the agenda to, to per make a perspective from the academic side um, as we what sort of he, source What is his expertise? Say again? What is what is He's been looking at the port. He's actually a sociologist, but he's been looking at the economic impact and the port. Uh, I've worked with his class now for several years, um, and I think he's got a, a good academic perspective right. on what's going on. So I recommend that he, he, but particularly somebody from Savannah, plus and puts the original concept of bringing in our own port customers to hear about what their perspective is. It, I think it will be. It may be more difficult than we think to get our competitors tell us how they beat us. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they'd be happy to brag about what you've done. But Brian, you're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a heavy lift. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll try to work on it. And, yeah. I, I will tell you, I, I know the fellow very, very well. headed up the Savannah Port for a long time, Bob Jepson, and uh, we kind of all in the room together, so I, I know Bob well. And uh, he's very, very proud of what they've done there, and they've done a good job. I would take this one level beyond this because I'm not sure you're going to hear maybe a, a lot from them except boosterism and that, that sort of thing, uh, and how they applied the capital and how the state was really behind them. I've heard all those stories so many times. I, I, I think I know what you're going to hear. What I would say would be much better would be a comparative analysis by an independent <coughs> consultant to tell us what are the strengths here and what are the weaknesses and where are you going different if you decide to go 47 feet except uh, as opposed to playing a pat hand. That kind of comparative analysis and then a very independent economic analysis I think sets the stage for the whole for the whole process. I think on the environmental front, the folks, the great folks at Riverkeeper, we're going to hear an awful lot about the environmental concern, and we probably ought to have a counterbalance to that uh, so that we uh, so we can get as close as possible to the trade-off. But step one, I think, is an economic analysis that tells us to where we stand as a court and not in an independent world because other places are doing improvements at the same time. So rather than with a, a flat table where we can make our analysis, we've got the walls moving and ceiling moving, there's a lot of moving parts in such an analysis. And there are people that can do that sort of thing for you. Uh, and in five places, we used to insulate some people in the finance department. They were allowed to have lunch with, with people from marketing, but that was about all. And made sure that they were in a place where if we had to, we could protect them with police protection. And the, 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 Martin, the Martin study should accomplish that, and we can specific, specify the question of comparative analysis of how this, I, I would think, Brian, that that could be part of that study is how does how does the pluses and minuses of Jacksonville vis-a-vis -vis Savannah, vis-a-vis -vis Miami, vis-a-vis -vis Charleston, um, in, in, a, in a simplistic way. The part of the issue is that's not going to be completed until. There is, there is a section in the strategic plan document today, and I think there's another document that John Martin put together really on the economic impact of assessment. 
actually does repair transit costs and the distribution costs and transportation costs between Jacksonville, Savannah, Charleston, and a number of other ports. So there is some work that's already been done on that that is available. And there are obviously other, there are many other strategic consultants that do this kind of work. And I know lots of them. Uh, if there is a concern somehow that you know, Martin's numbers are not right, uh, that he's too close to you know, Jacksonville and, and Jacksport, which I would refute, but if there are, there are other folks out there who can do an assessment like this. They've probably done them before, but it'll cost money and it'll take time. Well, I would suggest that, you know, with the, the various voices that you're going to have on this project, that as early as possible, that you can ensure all the players that the analysis is independent. But that, and I have, I, I have not had no uh, dog in this fight. I don't know the Martin folks. I'm not accusing them of not being independent. But if you reach crucial points and people raise their hands and say, this is a product of boosterism, it's not a product of careful analysis, uh, you're, you're going to have trouble in the process. In my and it should be current. Should be current. Which is probably few of y'all took that disc and read the whole Martin report. <laughs> it is it is required reading. I mean it is it goes in incredible depth. It goes into cost per DU to you know different places and goes into the where how we compete with it, um, but it's 2006 seven numbers, and so we've got to get that updated. Number one, I think, and we are do, we are doing that. Uh, we have uh, contracted with John for a supplemental uh, addendum to our strategic plan to include the updates of those numbers. And it may take us several months to get that work completed because he does do an actual interview process. That's one of the things that John does. Many other uh, impact assessments don't do. He actually takes the time to talk to over several hundred customers that actually do business with the port to make sure that the numbers he's putting in there are accurate and reflect reality. So my, my guess is right now we will not have that updated assessment from him until the end of June. But that's already in the process. It's in the process. It's okay. starting. Yes. But you know what we could do, John. <coughs> task force is we could listen to the Martin study with specific and we in the meantime we have heard customers and um, and important other I mean CSX I think is going to be a critical player here because of needing to do the improvements that are going to connect the port to uh, to, to transport to the road transportation network um, and, I, and like Jerry a lot uh, from Jacks USA, you know, getting a feel for how do, how does Jacksonville, can we compete? Because I think that's, a, as John said, a threshold question. And then once we've heard them and heard Martin, if we still, I don't think it would be too late given the time schedule, if we wanted to get another assessment, we would have that available to us. I think, I think um, I'll get with, with Brian in, in, in between time and talk to him about whether some other independent consultant would make sense how much it would cost um, you know maybe to get somebody like McKinsey to come down and say if you were doing this study is this good enough and um, then we'd know we'd have a thought and we can talk about it at the next meeting just curious Brian, what, what uh, the September 14th the, the Martin study update what was that? You said June before, so would we not? Would we have had an update before the September update? I'm not clear. On. I, I'm, I don't know if the dates on these have moved. Originally, we had talked about having John Martin come down here in June on June 18th. <coughs> he will probably be completed with most of the update. He may not be fully completed by June 18th, mm -hmm. but I will verify that with him uh, and make sure I get back to uh, co-chairs as to when he expects to. Okay, we've got it for August 7th. 
one of its latest things. So it looks like we've got three September. different models. I've got yeah, I've seen different ones floating around. I'm just not sure what date we want him. Uh, I think you guys need to tell me exactly when you want him, and we'll make sure it's could we just, Mr. Co-Chair, could we make certain we're all looking at the same material? I'm looking at what's I'm in front of me this morning here, and it says September, uh, Speaker John Martin. Yes. Is this not up to date? No, I, I think it's more up to date than what I was looking at. Okay. That's also where we reference the environmental impact. That was also October 2014. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We'll try to get that as soon as possible. Right? Uh, Mr. Chair, along the lines of what you were saying a little while ago, um, we probably want to get uh, a good idea of uh, the cost benefit um, financially before we even start uh, addressing um, economics and environmental concerns. But I would think that we would want to get some sort of commitment or some, some sort of statement from the folks in, uh, in Tallahassee. Um, and we can have somebody from the governor's office or Representative Ray, maybe you could come and, and speak on behalf of the state and give us some sort of confidence level of what we could count on from the state before we start getting into other issues. We would, we will try to get Secretary Prasad, State DOT, it, we were trying to maybe get him August, but we can get him as soon as yeah. is we can. practical. Because I can stay from a legislative point of view and from the uh, from the governor's office, I think that commitment is critical because without it, then if we, it isn't there, then the reason for it. Yeah, then then we would know a little better what the <coughs> Jacksonville local local um, number would be. It's, it's huge. Yeah, You're exactly right. Well, keep in mind too that one legislature, two legislature can <laughs> future legislatures, so they can they tell you what they can do in that one year. And that would be part of the question that we need to ask the secretary and the representative. That's an interesting point because we kind of got to know up front. Do you have any, y'all, doesn't report any 
suggestions? And I guess Brian can come up with as far as we prefer. Of course, we prefer coming into Jacksonville and going out of Jacksonville. If I go down to South Florida, I've got a truck additional expenses. I've got a truck container down to South Florida, then ship it. I prefer everything coming into Jacksonville. Cuts down on my expenses. I mean, if you think about it, you're looking at the overall picture, the bottom line, you're you're looking at the bottom line expenses because if your, your costs are up, you're going to raise your prices. So it's better just to have, if we can have it, coming into Jackson, we're much better off. And um, so, I mean, that's what we're looking at. There's containers that we're not even, and Brian will tell you this, there, there are uh, freight lines that will not even come in here because of, help of the port and uh, therefore we where we're shipping from all over the world it's much better for us if everything comes into Jacksonville if it comes into Savannah I've still got a truck to down to Jacksonville so. Brian as I looked at the Martin report it analyzed the value to the city of the jobs and so forth from the imports, the container imports, but there was really no discussion of what value the city would get if, if industry located in Jacksonville as opposed to Savannah or Tampa, uh, because we had that, we could load a ship and send it to China without having to stop places. Is there any way we could ask the Martin people to try to weigh in on that, or is that just a, so speculative that it's impossible? I, I was asked to stand by the microphone, so I'll do it this time. <laughs> um, the Martin study does actually address uh, exports. Um, it specifically states that there's 1.3 million TEUs that are coming into the state through uh, a non-Florida port, and there is 1.8 million TEUs of both export cargo and empty containers that are leaving the state through a non-Florida port. So it does address some jobs related to export activity that is actually moving through another port. It does not specifically say how many jobs would come from a manufacturing center established here that would then be exporting. Uh, we can certainly talk to John about that and see if there's a way for us to develop some kind of, uh, of an economic assessment around that that would provide some, at least some mile markers for the task force to look at. I, I think we could do that. Is that what you're asking for? That's exactly what I'm asking for. And I think the chamber probably, Jerry Malott might be a really good resource for them to talk to about what, what we've lost in the past what he talks to every day, what kind of... I think Jerry could be a good resource to... Because to, whatever you do there is going to be speculative, but Jerry can give you a feel whether you... And we can decide as a group, we don't believe what he's saying, or we do, but as far as how he thinks the deepening of the port would enhance our ability to attract... Okay, I'll, kind of I, I'll take that one as a to-do for me, and I'll report back to uh, uh, our co-chairs on that uh, within the next week or two. Other thoughts? Well, if you're like me, you'll have some later. <laughs> just, uh, this is just for my own clarification. Number one, I, I take it McKinsey is sort of the go-to economic study organization for CSX. Is that right? Or no? Well, I don't, I'm not familiar with McKinsey. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and so, secondly, uh, I like the idea of hearing from CSX. I think that gives us a little broader perspective. Was that intended to be part of the August 7th perspectives of port customers, or is that the shipping port customers? Well, what we thought, I mean, what my thinking is, is we could get, and whenever he can come, but secretary, we need to hear from the state. We would hear from Jerry Malott. We would hear from CSX and other customers that meeting um, and, and not that you have to have all those in, in one specific meeting because if the secretary couldn't come until or could come the 18th or not the 7th we do that and I would think that having McKenzie or whoever is the other uh, source we could do it you, you'd almost have to have the Martin report and then have some 
so they can look at it. So you can't really do have them speak until you've got the Martin report, I would think. Okay. And then trucking would be another one of the customers, the major trucking lines. I, yes. I, I just thought that might be helpful as well. <clears throat> I'm John, I'm not so, I think your point on industrial mm -hmm. development, if, if the purpose of this at the end of the day is to have high-paying local jobs, value-added industry, real, I mean, there's nothing better than what I'll call a screwdriver shop to fill cars where all ship parts come in and they put it all together, it's very, very clean, people make tremendous amounts of money. Georgetown uh, Toyota plant. Uh, if you're going to compete in that world, having a great port is very, very important. Okay. Thank you all. Um, I think the final thing we need to do. Oh, Tom. Would you like to wrap us up? And then we, we need some public comments after that. Could I ask a question in detail? I assume that uh, you and or that will be the spokespeople for this meeting, for this commission to the press. I think that's probably a good idea. I think Hap really does just a good job. We've got 25 people there, and I suspect that it'll be uh, determined who the spokespeople are for this commission. I think that's so one of the co chairmen will do it now and then. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll be the first interview. <laughs> Thank you. My first or last one. For, for um, um, potential people to come and speak to us um, about someone from the cruise industry or hospitality. Yeah. Um, again, because they're, we Absolutely. don't want to ignore that. Yeah. Great idea. But it would also be good when we hear from Brian again is how the port views the cruise industry as part of. Yes. In the future. In the future. Is that, is that something that they look at favorably or not? I mean, that's true. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a couple of points as you wrap up. Uh, one, one of the things that I pointed out in my remarks was the, the importance of having uh, all points of view heard. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm, I really appreciate you having that discussion about the environment and St. John's River. As you all know, the, the river is a critical asset of our city, uh, and it's important that we have a balanced approach, as I said earlier, in this process. So I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a rivers guy. I'm on the river all the time. Uh, you know, kayaking, I created more access to the river, big on it, so I think it's important, so I'm glad to hear you uh, discuss it. The other thing is I want to thank Quint uh, and Middlebrook uh, for their service. They're going to add value. They understand the river. And I want to, again, thank Lisa uh, Ronneman for being here with the Rivers Keeper as a part of this process. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have two boys who are 11 and 13, and uh, they love the river. Uh, it's a great asset and someone who is a dolphin in this room who went to JU, who lived on that river and was on that river just a couple of days ago with almost, what, a, I would say about 700 people there. Quint, uh, uh, we celebrated uh, Charter Day, 80 years of, of a great institution, Jacksonville University. And so uh, we pride ourselves uh, uh, about the river and protecting the river and making sure that it's, uh, it's a great place. Uh, so I want to thank you again for your, for your efforts. Just listening to the discussion, uh, it uh, reaffirms and confirm uh, that we have great, great minds in this room uh, to really uh, help us move forward. And again, I want to thank my my colleague Brian Taylor and his team. Uh, and my last point is that when it comes to the state, I want to be very clear from my perspective as mayor. Uh, I can't have I can't think of a better partner than having in Governor Scott, who's made a commitment to the ports, made it a priority. He's invested in the port, put up $36 million. He's been engaged in the process. Uh, we, the day we announced the port task force, uh, he committed. Uh, uh, Jerry Malat asked a question, Hap. Uh, you know, is it possible, is it possible 
that the, that the state would be able to help fund the port uh, every year annually in the budget. And it's just a question. And so it came up. So he's thinking about it. The governor is thinking about it. Uh, and so, um, and he's committed. I, I don't want to, I'm speaking because we were, you know, we've talked about this. So he's committed. The other thing I want to point out is, you know, there's this comparison of Savannah and Jacksonville. Just one thing to keep in mind. Savannah has, Georgia has one port. The state has invested every year in that port. Uh, and I think the, the governor who really, really solidified, Governor Purdue really focused on the port. So just, you know, I think the, the McKinsey study may be engaged because comparing apples to apples and orange to orange is key. Uh, <laughs> but I just think there's some things you just, we got to keep in mind. Uh, and so I think Governor Scott has been very focused on this like a laser. Uh, and uh, so I am very happy about that. And I just want to remind people that uh, he is definitely committed. And I think the question was asked, and I think Brian mentioned, you know, state usually pay 50%. I think the governor would be, I think he would consider making sure that uh, the state uh, continue to make an investment because it's all about jobs. Uh, and he understands that more than most. So thank you very much. Okay, I think it's normal protocol to invite the public to speak and have uh, three minute uh, comments if you could. Are there anybody from the public that would like to speak? Good morning. I'm Lisa Reineman. I'm your St. John's Riverkeeper. And thank you very much for all of the words that you said about the river being a critical asset to the, the city of Jacksonville, Northeast Florida. Thank you, Mayor, for being our kayaking mayor. It's been fun to see you and your family out on the St. John's. And that's why we have been involved in this process for more than two years now. The first meeting I had as St. John's Riverkeeper was with the Army Corps of Air Engineers. The second was with um, the Jacksport and making sure that we looked at a balanced approach to this. That's what we've been advocating all along. And so it really did uh, my heart good to hear all of you talking about and asking for some of the very things we've been asking for from day one on this issue. The multi-port analysis that Mr. Carpenter talked about, we think that's very critical. In fact, the Army Corps, their independent expert peer review, said that was a showstopper, the fact that the Army Corps did not conduct a multi-port analysis. They're only looking at this issue from an economic standpoint as well as an environmental standpoint in a silo. And that's not good business, that's not good planning. As well as an independent analysis of the local job numbers. That's been something we've been concerned about because we're, we fear that the economic um, benefits of this are being overestimated and overstated to downplay the environmental harm that will be done to the St. John's River. So while our mission is to protect the St. John's, We've started talking a lot about the economic side of it for that reason. We want to make sure, just as y'all have stated you want to do, have a balanced discussion, a balanced approach to this. I did take liberty to provide you a lot of reading material, and it talks about why we feel that the environmental harm has been underestimated. The mitigation plan is woefully inadequate. Originally, they were talking about investing $80 million into in mitigation. Now it's $2.9 million. And so the mitigation plan, despite all of our efforts, have actually gone from bad to worse. And so that's something we're still discussing with the Army Corps of Engineers. As well as it goes into detail asks, things that we believe as an organization this community could ask for to move this project forward, but in a balanced way that will help not only our community, but also protect the St. John's River that means so much to the economic vitality of Northeast Florida. So I look forward to working with you. Thank you for serving, and um, have a great day on the river this weekend if the rain stops. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. What, a, what an asset. Hello. Thank you for taking uh, some time for uh, public comments. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is David Jaffe. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of North Florida. Uh, I've been studying the uh, port economy uh, for about six years, both locally, nationally, and globally, uh, through the Ports Project. <clears throat> so I'm hoping to meet with the uh, task force at some time in the future to share some of the findings 
uh, of my research. Uh, but for the moment, I'd just like to make a couple suggestions. Given the cost of this project, and I really think that when it's all said and done, the total cost will be uh, closer to $1 billion rather than uh, 600 or 700 million. No project of this type has ever been uh, overestimated in terms of the cost. It's always underestimated. So there are many additional costs that have not been included, uh, and hopefully we can have some further discussion about that. That also means that the local uh, match and the obligation of uh, the local authorities or the city will be uh, probably at least 400 million, uh, if not more. So given the large cost of this project, um, I would strongly uh, encourage the task force not to rely exclusively on the cost-benefit analysis that has been done uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, which is rigorous but narrowly focused uh, on a reduction in transportation costs. There's very little in that report that addresses the kinds of benefits that would accrue to the local economy, uh, to the local population of uh, Jacksonville. Uh, I also would encourage you not to rely heavily uh, on the numbers and the projections of Martin Associates. Uh, Martin Associates uh, operates as a public relations firm for the port industry. Um, they are hired by ports to produce the reports um, that yield numbers that are then used to advance the um, agenda of the port. So when you look at the Martin Associates reports, please review those numbers with caution and interpret them in the context of what their role is in the port industry. Uh, for both these reasons, given the fact that the Army Corps of Engineers report is very narrow uh, and is not a full cost-benefit analysis and that the Martin Associates reports and projections and numbers uh, are produced by a firm that is closely connected to the port industry, I would definitely uh, suggest, as um, Mr. Carpenter has said, that you commission an independent, uh, impartial, uh, analysis of what the costs and the benefits of this project will be and the prospects of uh, success. Uh, finally, there is a significant part of the local uh, maritime port logistics uh, business community that is not represented by Jackport, and I would encourage you to spend time talking to them. Uh, Jackport is a major player. Uh, they're obviously an important, they play an important role in the local economy, but there are many people involved in this part of the local economy that are not represented uh, by Jacksport. They have different perspectives and they have a, a view of the prospects for success in this sector of the economy that don't necessarily require deepening to 47 feet. So I hope during your deliberations you will take the time to consult with and hear the perspective uh, of those businesses in the community that may not be represented by Jacksport. Thank you. Have you completed your your study? Uh, I've done different kinds of studies over time, and I'm looking at the socioeconomic uh, impact uh, of the port economy. Uh, and so I'm looking at the reliability generally of the, of the kinds of numbers that are being produced by Martin Associates and how other people have reviewed those numbers and found problems with them. Uh, and again, anytime you have uh, an agency that is hiring somebody to produce numbers, you have to realize that those people are getting paid to produce numbers that will look a certain way. You just have to be sure. You know, um, do, do you, where I was headed is, do you have anything you can share with us? Yes, I do have things I can share with you. And one thing I would like to uh, discuss are the kinds of jobs that are generated by this sector of the economy and the quality of those jobs and what they typically pay. Well, we'd love to have you come present at another time. And if there's anything in writing that you have that you'd like for us to have immediately, please funnel it through Chris Hand. Okay. Uh, in I think addition, any suggestions as far as consultants that could do a cost-benefit analysis and a couple of meaningful players as far as companies that are so to speak outside of the JPA that right. you mentioned? That are willing to come forward. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, one document that I did uh, produce, and I think it's in the um, binder that you've received from Lisa Reimer. Okay. So that's a, a very skeletal overview uh, of some of the perspective based on my research, but I'd be very happy to meet with the task force. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. And thanks for being here today. Any further? Yes. <laughs> 
I know you all are watching the weather map, so I will be brief. Um, my name is Sarah Owen Gledhill. I'm with the Florida Wildlife Federation. I'm the planning advocate of the Northeast Office based in St. Augustine. Um, as Mayor Brown alluded earlier, um, I first wanted to thank you as a task force for being here as volunteers, not at your uh, jobs that have billable hours and uh, more important, or not more important, but obviously other things that you could be doing. I also wanted to thank Mayor Brown and his staff for having the leadership for putting together this task force and calling upon this opportunity for the public to be more engaged and to have an open dialogue. So I wanted to thank you and the staff for, for doing this. Um, the Florida Wildlife Federation, we're supporters of economic development. We are certainly not anti-economic development. However, we are supporters of economic development that strive to rectify the foreseeable and negative impacts that can come about from projects. And we see that there are opportunities here that some of those impacts have not been um, properly identified and mitigated for, and we would encourage this process to vet those issue, issues out in the process. Um, one of the issues, as you can understand, we're greatly concerned about the impacts to wildlife and the associated habitats. Um, salinity changes, sedimentation issues, erosion issues, the actual blast of the river floor and how that impacts marine animals, as well as the increased shipping volume that comes through uh, with our right whale calving area just off our coast here. It has potential impacts. Um, these may not be only issues that affect wildlife, but obviously those that live on the river, those that work on the river, whether it's a commercial fishing industry, our hunters and anglers that recreate, and also all the folks that just um, ski and, and recreate in other fashions. Also of concern is the, um, as the river keeper alluded to, the well underfunded and conservatively designed mitigation plan. It was slashed, as it was already stated, from 80 million to 29 or 30.5 million. <clears throat> That's a drastic reduction. All we have to do is look south to our neighbors in the Everglades and to the folks with the Indian River Lagoon who are trying to restore those systems that is in the billions of dollars. And they're studying it. They're trying to figure it out. We don't want to have that same situation here where we're 20, 30 years down the road, spending billions of dollars trying to restore the river. So we are optimistic about this process. We do know that there are right choices. We do know that this is an opportunity for us to engage. We're going to be staying engaged with you all. We're going to be working with our partners, working with the public, and working with you as the task force members to raise questions and have those questions addressed and making sure that we have a balanced approach in promoting economic development but also not losing our St. John's River and impacting her to a point that 40 years down the road, somebody's not saying, why did they make those decisions? So thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Blake? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Lake Ray with the Florida House and have been very engaged in the activities that are going on uh, related to the port. Uh, like many of you, I am not only a long time resident, I'm a lifelong resident, the third generation of Jacksonville, and certainly a second generation of those who've worked on the St. John's River uh, in various capacities, particularly that of being a, uh, an engineer in maritime industry. Uh, I want to address a couple of things, uh, just to give you a couple of things to think about. When we talk about the deepening of the river, when we talk about what the impacts are and what the opportunities are, uh, a study has been released, and it's pretty much a, a solid, verifiable study that shows that 50% of the goods that we consume in the state of Florida come from other ports outside the state. Uh, let me change what that means to you and what it means to us. and. I think if you have that paradigm shift, it will show what the prospects mean for deepening the channel. And we can take the John Martin uh, study, and you can look at it any way you want to, but the fact is, is that the facts are what they will be. And here's what that is. If you've got 50% of the goods coming into the state from other ports that we're consuming, it means within 60 miles of where we sit right now, those goods are coming into. They're either coming by I-75, 
they're coming by I-95, they're coming by I-10, or they're coming down one of the two rail systems and ultimately connecting into uh, FEC or going further on the CSX line uh, and feeding the state. So what that means is, is you've got to look at this by the opposite way. Instead of looking at a statistic that says it's moving in, you need to say, what is it that we can do to capture that market? And how do we play into that? And when you're talking about <coughs> deepening the channel, we must necessarily take into consideration the concept that's being applied at the national level. What is it that's going on? We're attempting to become a gateway port. And if you want to become a gateway port, it means the goods that are going to come in, how they're going to flow uh, into the country. Most of these goods are going to be moving either towards Atlanta, they're going to be moving towards Chicago, or towards Memphis. For other places, for other opportunities to take those goods, break them down, add value to them, and then ultimately we wind up having them sent back to us in a different form and being consumed. And so what we need to be looking at is the bigger picture of what this means in terms of the deepening. It means that if it is moving within 60 miles of where we are, and as we've talked about this being a regional concept, then we must understand what that is and why it is important for us to take the consideration of deepening the channel. If I may add just a couple more comments uh, related to that. Uh, as many of you know, I'm now <coughs> the uh, president and executive director of the First Coast Manufacturers Association. Let me tie this into, again, why this is relevant, why the discussion today is so important. It has been shown, and not by a Martin study, that for every job created in manufacturing, you create the equivalent of three jobs. Now, contrary to what we see today going on in the United States, there is certainly some companies that are moving offshore. But what you're seeing is for a number of different reasons, companies are wanting to reshore to the United States. And I can give you a couple of quick reasons why that is. That's because of the productivity of our workforce. It's because of the cost of energy. While I don't like $3.60 per gallon of gasoline, it's still cheaper than anywhere else in the world. We have natural gas that's available to us because of technologies what's happened in terms of the amount of labor that goes into uh, that goes into the uh, product is 30 percent of labor versus what it was before 50 percent so there's a number of reasons why they're coming back so when you talk about reshoring if you put yourself in the right position for bringing raw materials out and exporting them then that makes us even more viable those are some comments, and I'll be glad to share more later. Thank, Thank you. you, Ryan. Thank you, Lee. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, my name is Dave Bruderly, and I am a graduate of the United States Merchant Marine Academy, class of 69. I'd get, like to just, I, don't, I can't do this in three minutes, but you got to put a little historical context behind the United States maritime industry. I went to Kings Point believing that the United States was a strong maritime power, looking back on our history, back to the, the founders. We had a fantastic merchant navy in those days. What I have seen happen in the United States over the past 45 years is the disintegration of the United States maritime industry because of a failed national maritime policy. <coughs> if you, we have a fantastic naval capacity for shipbuilding, we have a very bad capacity to build commercial ships. If you follow the money on the container ships and other large ships, passenger ships, cruise ships, whatever, they are no longer manufactured in the United States at U.S. shipyards. We have the shipyards right outside here. It is testament to that. That is a result of a failed national policy that really didn't understand the, the role of the maritime industry. Now, that's relevant to this discussion because most of the cargo, the most profitable cargo that comes in and out of this port is because of the Jones Act. And it's Crowley and Sea Star and Trailer Bridge who are serving our natural markets in the Caribbean, the regional markets, and they're exporting products to the Caribbean and Puerto Rico. Our export trade to China consists of 
waste paper, scrap steel, scrap electronics, no value added manufactured goods, almost none whatsoever. And if you follow money on who's financing the expansion of the Panama Canal, who's building the ships and profiting from these mega ships, if you follow the money of who funded dredging the port of Mariel, Cuba, which is Havana, to 58 feet, it's Chinese investors. We have people in this state screaming to open up Cuba for trade, which I strongly support. If Mariel becomes open to the United States, your first in, last out port for the Gulf, Gulf Coast ports and southeast ports in terms of transshipment of trade, your first in, last out port will be Mariel, Cuba. They can go from Mariel to, to any Gulf Coast port in a 40-foot channel or, or less. So, you know, I hate the fact that this debate is being framed as we're competing against Charleston and Savannah, because we're not. American manufacturers, American middle class workers are competing against low labor cost Asian manufacturers. And I frankly don't believe the economic studies that tell me that dredging this channel another seven feet or even dredging Savannah or Charleston to reduce the cost of importing more cheap junk from Asian manufacturers is going to create value-added jobs in this country, in the Southeast. So my point is, don't let, we're not competing against Charleston and Savannah in the, con, in the macroeconomic context. And the problem is that the Corps of Engineers, nobody, the Congress has not done the macroeconomic analysis of what is in the best national interest of this country with respect to our maritime policy and our trade policy. We, we're, pit, you know, I, I respect Mr. Taylor for what he's done because he's doing what he's paid to do, which is compete against Charleston and Savannah. But I don't think that's what we need to be doing here. We need to be figuring out how do we create, as, as Lake Ray said, value-added manufacturing jobs here so we can export those products to our natural markets. And providing a billion dollar subsidy here, Savannah, Charleston, you add up all the numbers, you go up to Elizabethtown, New Jersey, and New York. <laughs> We're, we're spending $10 billion as a nation dredging our ports to accommodate South Korean shipbuilders and, and Asian speculators who are trying to make a fast buck by exporting more of their stuff to Americans. And we're, we're stupid enough to buy it. Thank you. Thank My you. last point, go look at the port of Long Beach, Los Angeles. Google it. Look at the footprint. Look at the footprint for Elizabeth, for the Elizabeth up in New York, New Jersey and see what the land use requirements are to support a first in, a first class, first in, uh, last out port that takes advantage of, of the lion, which is the, the Asian trade. And ask yourself, where are all those impervious services, where all that, where's all that pavement gonna be uh, placed to support a first in, last out Asian trade, which we, we've heard we want to have, but we also know that our competition has a 58-foot port in Havana, not a 47-foot port in Jackson. Thank you, sir. Thank you. you. You make, you obviously have a wealth of knowledge, and we'll get back to you. Thank you all for being here. One of the things that happened and I are going to do our best to do is get you out of here on time. We may not accomplish the deepening of the board, but you are going to get out of here on time. We appreciate your help. We appreciate your interest. And thank you. And have a thank you very much. Great weekend.